Why we love the Tang Dynasty, exploring the history and charm of what's seen as one of the greatest imperial dynasties in Chinese history. Episode 14, Tang Music Turns Inwards. In this episode, we'll end our musical journey through the Tang Dynasty by seeing how the decline and eventual fall of the dynasty was reflected in its music. I'm Bob Jones, and in this podcast series, we're getting to know the Tang Dynasty and attempting to discover how, at its height, it was possibly the most prosperous, interconnected and innovative country in the world with a rich and influential legacy that survives to this day. For the most part, the Tang Dynasty was progressive, forward-moving and achieving. It was open-hearted and kept an equally open mind to the outside world, welcoming a vast range of peoples, cultures and ideas into its hearth. But what goes up must come down. It's a law of nature. We need to talk about An Lushan. An Lushan was a Chinese general of Iranian and Turkish noble descent. The Eastern Turks had been conquered by Emperor Taizong of Tang right at the beginning of the Tang dynasty. Due to unrest, many fled to Tang China for safety. If they had military skills or backgrounds, then they were welcomed into the Tang army. For a while, they were held back from rising too high by opposition within government. Many feared an enemy within who might rise to challenge the accepted order of the Tang. But opposition was eventually swept away and non-native generals were appointed to high positions. An Lushan was one such general. During frequent visits to the capital, he became the favourite of the Emperor Xuanzong and his consort Yang Guifei. Through Yang Guifei's patronage, he was eventually made governor of three major frontier provinces, giving him control of the eastern half of China's frontier and putting him in control of 40% of Tang forces. On a flimsy pretext, he marched on the Tang eastern capital Luoyang, where he proclaimed himself emperor of a new dynasty. He went on to march on the Tang capital itself, Chang'an. The emperor fled south, and his guard mutinied and demanded the death of Yang Guifei for her role in furthering An Lushan's career. Her assassination, as we know, went on to inspire poetry, novels, and more recently, films. Eventually, the rebellion was crushed, but the Tang dynasty was never the same again. The whole experience brought far-reaching social and economic change for the rest of the dynasty's last 100 years or so. The An Lushan Rebellion marked a turning point in Tang fortunes. For the next 144 years, the Tang ceased to exist in all but name, a far cry from its glorious days under Emperors Taizong and Xuanzong. In an effort to quickly establish peace after the rebellion, the Tang dynasty pardoned many rebels and put some of them in command of their own garrisons, eroding the authority of the central government. Tang economic control of the northeast region became intermittent, and the emperor became only a puppet at the bidding of the strongest garrison. The toll of dead and missing during the rebellion numbered 36 million, or two-thirds of the total population on the tax rolls at the time. It was little short of a disaster. The rebellion caused a huge amount of soul-searching in artistic circles. The literati questioned everything that the dynasty was based on. Nothing seemed certain or reliable anymore. The pain of revolt turned many of them to turn inwards, and this was arguably reflected in the music of the time. 
Music was seen as a way to examine the self, understand the world, and to forget the problems of the present. People took to collecting folk songs, homesick for the better days of the dynasty in the past. Nostalgia was king. This focus on the people, their folk tales and music prompted a significant development in Tang musical culture. An art form known as Tzu came to the fore, which saw its heyday in the Song dynasty which was to follow. Highly stylized, it is poetry which is sung. It is characterized by lines of unequal length with fixed rhyming schemes which reflected the natural rhythms of speech. What started as a street art form was picked up by professional female singers and then by literati poets. It moved out of the cafes and street bars and into the gardens where literati and royalty held their gatherings. Whereas the words of the tzu might change, they were sung to some 300 existing pieces of music which had their own titles and oftentimes had little to do with the subject of the poems. As such, they could be seen as a repository of folk memory. The greatest Tzu poet of the period was Li Yu, the last monarch of the Southern Tang dynasty. More than 30 of his lyrics have survived. There is always a touch of melancholy to be found within them. But in keeping with the decline of the earlier Tang dynasty, his works are suffused with grief and despair of losing his own kingdom. Like many of his predecessors, Li Yu was an accomplished painter, calligrapher, collector, and musician. Tzu lyric poetry often expresses those feelings that are prevalent at the time, such as longing, loss, and desire. Sometimes the poet would take on a persona in order to tackle a subject which could be on a wide range of topics. The main difference with what had come before, though, was that the subject matter and staging weren't big and grand and focusing on dynastic opulence, rather they were narrow in subject, intimate and highly personal. One of the most important sources of our knowledge about Tang Dynasty music is actually the poet Li Bai. It's suggested that he was one of the first Tzu lyric poets, but there is much debate about that. But what he did do was write poetry about music, the performers, and the places in which they were inhabited, painting a picture of the sounds they would create. Traces of the flourishing grandiose past of Tang music were still to be seen, but the country was feeling sorry for itself, national power was declining, and the scholars of the period, the literati, were struggling to find positivity in the world around them. The echoes of the drumbeats that so often heralded the start of epic performances were beginning to fade. Bai Jui liked retro music, he liked ritual music, the music that should be played in temples, at court and during celebrations and commemorations, maybe because it appealed to his desire to find certainty, a solid base. He loved folk music, probably because it too was rooted in the past and had somehow survived everything that life wanted to throw at the tongue. He liked poetry and music that reflected the fleeting moments in an uncertain world.
Naturally enough, this gentility of thought was also reflected in the popularity of instruments. Lutes and pipa took center stage. They needed instruments that sounded like thunder and enchantment, strings that are noisy like rain but could also whisper. Instruments became artworks in their own right. There are some in a museum dating back to the Tang Dynasty that are made of sandalwood and maplewood. Their bodies are decorated with flowers and birds and inlaid with shells. The patterns are brilliant and varied, showing hunting feast scenes, mountains and water, elaborate patterns. Their beautiful decorations suggest that not only was the music highly valued, but also the musicians who played it. And so we come to the end of our survey of Tang music. What we know for certain is that Tang China was never a silent place. Just as the streets were filled with the chatter and intrigue of a hundred nationalities, so too their air was filled by hundreds of songs. The music was often accompanied by dancing and acrobatics. It was used to carry the human voice, which was supported by the finest poetry of its day. During the 300-year existence of the dynasty, the music celebrated the achievement and victory of prosperity and growth, and then, later, the sorrow and introspection of decline and fall. Regardless of the motive and means used by the people of the Tang to make their music, their musicians have made an indelible mark on the sound culture of China even to this day. Special thanks go out to San Lian Zhengdu for their help in creating the content for this show. This is Bob Jones. Thanks for listening. Join me again next time.